Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon's Contera Global Webinar on Transfer Pricing and Mandatory Disclosure. <laughs> Welcome to meet and greet you all. Um, it is a quite large community that we have this afternoon, so we all hope that the infrastructure doesn't fail. <laughs> Today we will guide you through the new EU directive on mandatory disclosure, <coughs> which is really new to all of us. Uh, tax advisors, transfer pricing advisors, tax directors, tax managers, but also the, uh, the tax inspectors. It's a brand new world to, to all of us. Um, <coughs> we will be presenting uh, today um, Rudolf Sinks, that's me, one of the uh, managing directors of Contera Global. Um, Together with Stefan Ubachs, director with us, <coughs> and particularly Stefan has made a uh, quite a study on what's going on on this topic. In the index of today, <coughs> we will see uh, the introduction about what we are about to discover, uh, the timeline, a timeline, a Dutch timeline this time, <coughs> which will guide you through the reporting um, deadlines of all of this. Then we will uh, take a deep dive into the arrangements that have to be reported. We will uh, definitely focus on the transfer pricing specific hallmarks that you may expect from us, but we will also touch upon some non-transfer pricing spe specific hallmarks with a transfer pricing flavor. We will end the presentation with some practical aspects as to how to bring this all further. So uh, in this one hour presentation, we will hope to uh, to be able to guide you through this new material. Uh, any comments or suggestions that you may have, please note so on your screen. Um, uh, it will be shown uh, on our uh, screen if you have any suggestion or question that you may ask. And um, uh, when, when possible, we will also pick that up. Um, Oké, okay, dan we may start en daarbij may hand over to colleague Stefan. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rudolf, for your uh, introduction. Um, welcome everybody um, to this uh, webinar on uh, mandatory disclosure. Um, so let us first have a brief look at what the mandatory disclosure directive um, actually is all about. Um, we will not go um, into very much detail of the general aspects of the Mandatory Disclosure Directive, um, as most of you will be already familiar uh, with those, as we, uh, as we assume. Um, and to, in this next hour, we want to um, pay as, especially uh, uh, as much time as possible to the transfer pricing aspects and the various hallmarks that are relevant from a transfer pricing point of view. Um, um, as a brief introduction, um, the uh, Mandatory Disclosure Directive was enacted in June 2018 by the Council of the EU as part of the EU's initiative in order to increase tax, tax transparency and also to um, enhance fair taxation in the internal market. So the mandatory disclosure is definitely a next step in providing tax administrations throughout the EU with more insight on the structures that are advised by tax intermediaries and are being set up by taxpayers themselves. Um, the directive uh, introduces an obligation and reporting obligation primarily for tax intermediaries. Um, uh, and if no tax intermediary is involved in the establishment of an arrangement, uh, then the, the relevant taxpayer should make the report himself. Um, when talking about intermediaries, um, you should note that 
uh, not only uh, external intermediaries like tax and law firms, OTP advisors qualify as an intermediary, but also um, uh, an, a group entity that has an in-house tax department that uh, provides uh, a tax and transfer pricing advice to uh, other group companies um, can qualify as an intermediary, um, provided of course that all the other conditions for reporting are met. Um, you do not have to report, however, as an intermediary if another intermediary is already involved uh, and already has fulfilled the um, reporting requirements. Um, uh, but in that case, it is highly recommended that you make sure that you get a copy of the registration number that that will receive from the competent tax authority after he has made um, its, uh, his report. Um, um, Uh, if we have a brief look at the timeline, um, and in this case we used the uh, the Dutch timeline as um, as an example, um, the uh, the, uh, the mandatory disclosure directive entered into f force as from the 25th of June of 2018, which means that effectively the um, directive has uh, a retroactive um, uh, aspect. So it has retroactive working um, as, from the two uh, as, as from the 25th of June 2018, which means that you should make sure that you um, uh, collect information on any possible uh, or any potentially reportable transactions that you were involved in as from that date. So that is um, uh, over, over the last two years. Um, the domestic implementation of the mandatory direct disclosure directive should have been completed on the 31st of December 2019, which um, also happened in, uh, in most of the member states. And initially, the intention was that the um, uh, the directive would, uh, or that you would have to for, to report for the first time uh, on the first of July 2020. However, as we all know, uh, something happened in the first half of this year, which is the COVID crisis, and. Um, Within the EU, it was decided that member states have uh, 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 the possibility to uh, postpone the reporting obligations. It's not mandatory for member states to uh, apply that extension. Um, uh, 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 most of the member states did, uh, some didn't. Uh, for example, Germany didn't, uh, but uh, Net the Netherlands um, make use of that possibility. The new date for the first reporting is now set uh, at the 1st of January next year. Uh, so that's an extension of six months, uh, which is also the date that the Dutch web portal will be ready for uh, reporting. So as from that date, uh, Dutch uh, uh, tax intermediaries and Dutch taxpayers can uh, 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 file a first report. Um, the deadline for filing arrangements that uh, took place between the 1st of July of this year and the 31st of December of this year is the 31st of uh, 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 January. Um, and the deadline for filing arrangements that took place between the 25th of June and uh, uh, the 30th of June of this year is 28 February 2021. 20, uh, 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 um, so 
the, the extension is a bit shorter for newer uh, 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 arrangements. Um, and as on the 30th of April, um, that will be the first time that uh, uh, the exchange between member states will take place. Um, and after the 1st of January, you should make sure that um, any uh, uh, reportable transactions that um, will be made available or are ready for implementation uh, should be reported within 30 days after uh, that arrangement has been made available for the first time or after the first step in the implementation process uh, uh, has been made. Um, so what kind of TP arrangements must be reported under the directive? Uh, well, first of all, well, there are basically three elements that are important. First of all, it has to concern an arrangement. Uh, what is an arrangement? Well, there is no uh, precise definition in the wording of the, uh, of the directive, but in any case, we can uh, reach the conclusion that um, agreements between uh, group entities um, fall within uh, the scope. So, from a transfer pricing point of view, intercompany transactions uh, uh, will certainly qualify as an arrangement. And the same is also true for intercompany dealings. So, uh, dealings between um, a head office and uh, its permanent establishment. Um, we are dealing in this case with. Um, internal market, um, so um, it has to be a cross-border arrangement and cross-border means in this case that the arrangement should involve more than one uh, EU member state, so for example the Netherlands on the one hand side and the other side Germany, or it should involve uh, a EU member state and uh, a non-EU member state. Any arrangements that occur between uh, uh, the same uh, member states do not uh, qualify as reportable under the directive. Um, uh, and the same is true for uh, arrangements that occur between two non-member states without any involvement of an entity in an EU member state. Um, I should note, however, that uh, the EU uh, mandatory disclosure directive uh, contains minimum requirements, so uh, member states do have the possibility to re require uh, uh, taxpayers also to report uh, 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 arrangements that occur within that very same member state. However, the Netherlands has not used that. Um, so it should be a cross-border arrangement but it should also be a reportable uh, cross-border arrangement. Uh, when is uh, 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 an arrangement considered as a reportable arrangement? That is uh, uh, described in Annex 4 to the directive, which contains a large number of so-called hallmarks. And if we uh, turn to uh, uh, transfer pricing, the most important hallmarks are the TP specific hallmarks included uh, under E1, uh, 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 2 and 3. Um, and so, so those are the most important um, from our point of view. But there are also a number of other hallmarks that uh, can certainly be relevant from a transfer pricing point of view um, as they concern uh, intercompany payments. Um, and we will touch upon those uh, briefly uh, uh, later on in this uh, uh, presentation. Um, of course, it is also uh, very relevant what you do not have to report. Um, and 
the Dutch tax administration has uh, provided some examples of uh, activities that do not have to be reported um, and they can concern mainly compliance matters. For example, uh, the preparation of transfer pricing documentation for past years um, does not qualify as a reportable arrangement. So even if you uh, come across uh, 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 an arrangement that could fall under the scope of one of the hallmarks, and when you describe that in your transfer pricing documentation, that description as such is not a reportable um, activity. Uh, the same is true for uh, updates um, of uh, uh, benchmark studies, um, submit the submission of uh, a tax return, uh, 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 preparation of due, due diligence reports or assistance during a tax audit. Um, however, what you of course should note and should be aware of that during um, a transfer pricing documentation uh, 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 project, you can come across uh, some possibilities for improvement of an existing structure for your client, um, or you can come across uh, on uh, a certain uh, a, a group of functions, assets and risks that uh, uh, better could be shifted to another part of the group. Um, and if you start an advisory uh, process on those kinds of, of elements, uh, that is something that could be reportable later on um, if it comes to uh, uh, an implementation as well, of course. Um, so, uh, brief examples of what situations could fall under the scope of the directive. First example concerns an entity in the US and an entity in India, um, two non-EU countries, so uh, those will not be uh, uh, reportable. Uh, second situation concerns uh, uh, a Dutch entity that has a permanent establishment in India. Uh, there is an intercompany dealing between those, uh, uh, be, be, between the Netherlands and uh, its, uh, its permanent establishment. Uh, so that could be uh, reportable, uh, provided, of course, that uh, uh, it also meets the conditions of one of the hallmarks. And the same could be true uh, in respect of uh, an entity that has a salesperson in Belgium, if that is, for example, a permanent uh, representative, and an uh, arrangement takes place uh, which is reportable, that would qualify uh, as well. Um, so let us now turn to the uh, uh, TP specific hallmarks that are. Uh, 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 well, of course, for us, we find it very unjustified that they are uh, included last in the uh, in the directive, but certainly not least, although in most presentations there is uh, not much time to to touch upon the uh, uh, the hallmarks that are mentioned under E. So, but we will start. Uh, so we will start right there. Um, there are three TP-specific hallmarks. Um, the first TP-specific hallmark is an arrangement that involves the use of unilateral safe harbor routes. The second hallmark concerns uh, a transfer of hard to value intangibles. And the most interesting one is the third hallmark, um, which uh, concerns arrangements involving the cross-border transfer of functions, uh, risks or assets within uh, a group. Um, and of course that last hallmark is something what well, you will encounter all the time 
during your advisory work and also um, as a group that will be something that will uh, happen uh, frequently. Um, what is very important to note is that uh, the main benefit test does not apply to any of these TP specific hallmarks. Um, and that's different from uh, most of the uh, most of the hallmarks. Uh, for most of the other hallmarks, most of the other hallmarks do not apply, uh, or do only apply if um, the main benefit of the arrangement uh, is that the, uh, the taxpayer can uh, reasonably expect um, uh, to obtain a tax advantage. Um, which makes it, of course, uh, easier for, uh, for, for, for tax advisors and their uh, clients to decide whether you should report or not. But for these three TP-specific hallmarks, um, this main benefit test does not apply. And that means that if you meet the conditions of uh, the wording of the hallmark, you should always report, even if uh, the transaction takes place uh, for sound business reasons. So if it is perfectly legitimate to transfer a function uh, within the group, if that takes place under red arms length conditions, you should have uh, um, you, you do have to report that. And we will come to uh, uh, some of the, uh, some examples later on. But let us first start with um, the first TP specific hallmark, the unilateral safe harbor rules. Um, so they apply to uh, uh, safe harbor rules in respect of transfer pricing, uh, which are uh, enacted by a single country. Uh, so that means that if the rule um, is based on uh, uh, international consensus, um, it is not considered as a unilateral safe harbor rule. And the, the best example of that are the safe harbor rules that the OECD uh, applies for low value adding services. Uh, so if you, uh, will, will, as you will know, um, uh, according to the to the new OECD TP guidelines, uh, you can apply a 5% markup for low value adding services and that will then be considered as at arm's length. So if a country enacts a provision in its domestic law that is similar to that OECD requirement, then it is not considered as um, a, a unilateral safe harbor uh, rule. So you would then not have uh, to report that. Um, something that you should uh, report um, are other uh, uh, safe harbor rules that deviate from uh, uh, the, the OECD safe harbor for uh, low value adding services, um, but not in all cases. So, so let us have a look at this example. So we have entity A uh, um, and entity B. Uh, entity B has provided uh, a loan to, to entity A. Uh, and, um, the, and country B has a safe harbor rule that it considers um, uh, an interest payment between 2.5 and 4% as at arm's length. Um, the interest applied on that loan is 3%, uh, but, and it is not supported by a benchmarking study. Uh, this is something that has to be uh, reported. Um, because this is a, this is a unilateral 
safe harbor rule enacted by country B. Um, however, if that uh, uh, percentage is supported by uh, a benchmarking study, then uh, uh, it is not necessary to report it uh, because you then do not only rely upon that unilateral safe harbor rule, uh, but you also have the benchmarking study. But so it's the, the, the let's say the conventional way to demonstrate that the remuneration is at arm's, le arm's length. However, you should make sure that that benchmarking study is available at the moment that the loan was entered into. So uh, if, the if the study is available uh, uh, at the moment that you provide the loan, uh, you do not have to report it, but you cannot decide after two years. Uh, so, so if the, the, this loan was, was granted in July 2018, you cannot repair, uh, you, you, you cannot prevent a reporting obligation just by uh, performing a benchmarking study. Um, as for the second hallmark, um, that concerns how to value intangibles. And well, the first question you could of course ask is, well, which intangible is not hard to value? Uh, because the, the valuation of intangibles is uh, uh, in itself uh, uh, very difficult. Certainly when you look at the, uh, the future, uh, what you, uh, uh, d d d d d by, by nature, by the very nature, uh, uh, it is difficult. Um, what what gives well there's relative unfortunately relatively uh, uh, less but relatively few guidance on that. Um, it concerns uh, the transfer of uh, uh, hard to value intangibles um, which are intangibles for which no reliable comparables exist. Um, the projected future cash flow and income is highly uncertain at the time that the transaction was entered into. And it should concern a transfer between associated uh, um, enterprises, uh, which is defined as uh, an interest of at least 25%, which is a relatively low percentage. Of course, there is some guidance uh, included in the OECD TP guidelines in chapter six. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have also have some guidance in the, in the transfer pricing decree, but also, but that is also uh, quite uh, uh, limited. Um, so, if we look look at an example um, before the transfer, we have uh, um, the entity. A has parent company of entity B. Um, entity B has IP related, uh, IP that is related to software that needs to be further developed in the future. And there are several potential scenarios uh, uh, for the future. It, uh, it may look very good, but still uncertain. Entity B also performs all the, all the DEMPI functions. And uh, after the transfer, the, the, the IP and the corresponding uh, uh, DEMPI functions are transferred by entity B to entity C, uh, which makes a, a compensation payment to entity B. Um, so in this case, there is a transfer of that IP and the, the various DEMPI functions, um, which you could uh, uh, qualify as uh, uh, a transfer of um, a hard to value intangible uh, given the uh, uncertainty on the uh, uh, future income, the future scenario that will happen uh, 
Uh, it doesn't make a difference that there is a price adjustment clause. Um, so there is some guidance on that from the Dutch tax administration. Um, so this is uh, something that likely has to be reported. Um, when we have a look at the third hallmark um, that concerns the uh, transfer price, the, the transfer of functions, uh, assets um, and risks or risks, um, that is the uh, the hallmark that well we we encounter the most, and also expect that that will uh, will be the same for any uh, uh, companies listening in. Um, and when is um, uh, wh wh when does a transfer fall under the scope of this hallmark? That is the case if it concerns a cross-border transfer uh, of uh, functions, uh, risks or assets within uh, the group uh, where the projected annual EBIT of the transferer during the three years after the transfer is less than 50% of the projected annual EBIT um, if the transfer had not been made. So you um, you should um, uh, you, you, you should calculate the the EBITs or you should estimate the EBITs uh, for the period uh, for a three year period after the transfer in a case that uh, the transfer did not occur and compare that to uh, uh, the EBIT for those same years taking into account that transfer. And that again is of course uh, uh, can of course be a, a difficult exercise um, uh, because you will have to 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 make yeah some kind of an educated guess uh, and you would have to do uh, what a well hyper uh, hypothetically uh, informed uh, person would would do and would consider as a sound projection. Um, but again, that that can be uh, in some cases it can be uh, it can be difficult. Um, we, we will give some examples later on. Um, an, an example could be uh, uh, when you change the functional profile of a uh, from a full fledged distributor to a limited risk distributor. Um, so then the distributor, that full-fledged distributor, uh, transfers part of its function to uh, uh, to another group entity and only a limited profile uh, uh, remains. Um, same is true for uh, uh, the transfer of, uh, uh, of assets as part of an asset deal. Uh, can also be the transfer of uh, intangibles, let's say other than, than hard to value intangibles. Um, and it can also be uh, a reallocation of functions, uh, uh, assets and risks between uh, uh, the principal and a permanent establishment. Uh, so let's have a look at um, an example. And so we have uh, the, the situation before the transfer is that uh, we have a fully fledged distributor um, and uh, um, a, a transaction takes place in which uh, a, a part of the function, sales function is reallocated from entity B to entity A. Um, and entity B remains with a limited risk distribution. Uh, um, if we look at, um, then we would have to make the uh, uh, an estimation of the projected EBIT for uh, uh, the next three years. Uh, so let's say 2021, 22 and 23. Um, and uh, we would also have to do the same um, 
um, uh, as if the, 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 the transaction did not take place. So in this example, assuming that the um, transaction would not have taken place, um, you would you would have realized um, an EBIT of 1,090 in total, and after and taking into account reallocation, it will be 540. Uh, so that is a um, reduction of the EBIT of 50.5%, uh, which is more than 50%. So it means that you have uh, uh, you have to report this. Um, and what is also relevant to note, because in this example we have a, a change in the functional profile, but what can of course also happen is that the functional profile in itself remains the same, but you um, transfer part of that uh, activities. For example, if you use to uh, distribute um, uh, goods to clients in, let's say, four different countries, uh, let's say Netherlands, Belgium, France and Germany, and um, as, as a full-fledged distributor, and then you transfer the client portfolio in respect of uh, France to uh, 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 the other group company, you are then also reallocating part of your function uh, uh, and part of your risks to another group entity. So you should then also make the calculation um, that can qualify as well. Um, an example to illustrate that uh, this hallmark can have strange, uh, uh, can have a strange outcome, is uh, is this example. So um, let's assume that uh, we have uh, 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 an entity with a, uh, a total income in 2000 uh, in the period 2021 to 2023 of 2000 um, and without a, a reallocation uh, that means that would mean that that entity would pay in country a 30 percent corporate income tax so 600 uh, entity b um, has a total income of two of uh, 1,090, and tax would be that entity B would pay in country B would be 20% corporate income tax, so that would be 218. In total, at group level, you would then pay 600 plus 218 is 818 euro in corporate income tax. Now. Suppose that entity B transfers part of its function to entity A and that the income related to that transfer activity would amount to 550 in those years. So and at the right hand side, you then see the calculation after the reallocation, which would mean that entity A's total income would amount to 2550 after the reallocation, on which uh, uh, 30% income tax is payable in country A being 765, whereas the income of entity B decreases with 550 uh, in those years. That's the income related to the transferred function and the total income is 540. On which entity B has to pay 20% tax being 108. So after the reallocation, the total corporate income tax payable by the group is 873. So you now see that although the directive has been written to, um, uh, to, to, to reduce uh, any uh, uh, transactions that are potentially aggressive, um, this is the other way around. Um, as a result of uh, uh, the shift in, in, in functions, the transfer of functions, uh, the, the, the group's tax burden increases, but as we do not have any main benefit test in the, um, uh, in the mandatory disclosure directive, it still has to be reported 
because the uh, the EBIT of the transferer being entity B um, uh, is reduced with more than 50%. So this, this is a bit of an odd outcome, but uh, this is how it works. Uh, and uh, um, the, uh, an, another example uh, which can be can can lead to to a bit of an unexpected outcome is is the is the next one. Uh, so suppose that you um, have a head office in uh, country A, um, and you have uh, 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 a support uh, a support activity in country B. So entity B only performs routine support activities. Let's say just an administrative activities and it is remunerated. Uh, so those are low value adding services uh, and they are remunerated with a cost plus of 5% on the own costs of entity B, not more. That's all that happens. Um, and after a while, the, the group decides that those activities could better be reallocated to uh, uh, to, to, to the head office. So those activities are transferred to entity A. Uh, you should then make, again make the calculation. So assume that the, um, the EBIT of entity B being the transferer uh, would have been five uh, in each of 2021, 22 and 23, would then be reduced to zero as it does not have any activities after uh, uh, after the transfer, so it would then, then be zero, which means that mathematically the EBIT of entity B is reduced uh, with 100%, so you should report this as well. Uh, so even if it is a very small activity, minor activity, that cannot lead to any discussion with the tax administration, it's something you still have to report based on the wording of the uh, uh, of the hallmark. Um, of course, um, what you can do uh, to, well, you, 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 you should report it, but what you of course can do to reduce the, the risk on questions of the tax administration or potentially even a tax audit as a result of, uh, of a reporting, um, is that you, uh, when you make a report, clearly indicate in your description of the arrangement uh, that it only concerns the transfer of routine support activities that were remunerated on a cost plus basis. So if you use that description possibility uh, in the reporting forms, uh, you, uh, you inform the tax administration on the materiality of the of the transaction, which in any case reduces uh, the risk on uh, 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 on additional questions, but you should still uh, still report it. Uh, another example um, is uh, uh, a cross border merger. So uh, if uh, 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 a cross-border merger takes place between entity A and entity B, uh, in which entity B is the uh, uh, entity that will uh, that will disappear, uh, and entity A will acquire uh, will acquire the assets of entity B. Um, um, uh, then and after and after the trans after the merger. Uh, 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 a permanent establishment of uh, entity A remains in country B. Uh, this means that uh, uh, entity B, so the subsidiary as a separate taxpayer, does no longer exist in country B as taxpayer. So that means that the uh, EBIT of that taxpayer is reduced to zero in uh, the next three years because it has been merged into entity A. Um, and it doesn't matter that entity A still carries out the very same activities in country B. Um, 
so this is again something that has to be reported because the uh, the EBIT of the transfer entity B is reduced with more than 50%. Uh, the outcome would be different if uh, entity B would have been loss making. Um, and um, if the expectation is that entity B would continue to be loss making in the next three years, um, you would end up in a situation that um, without a merger, you would have, let's say, three, uh, 300 in losses. And after the merger, the result of entity B would be zero because it does no longer exist. And that means that the, uh, the EBIT of the transfer uh, uh, actually in, would increase as a result of the transfer. So there is no reduction. Uh, and in that case, you do not have to report it. So also in case of mergers, and also the same applies to liquidations, uh, you should always check what is the expected outcome after that. And um, even a very, very small activity that still realizes a, a positive EBIT, which is then reduced to zero as a result of merger or liquidation, can be something that you should report because again, we do not have that main benefit test in these hallmarks. Um, what is also relevant to note is that um, you should look at the commercial EBIT and that's different from uh, uh, the, uh, the application of the, of the anti-tax avoidance directive. Uh, so, for example, if you're familiar with the, 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 uh, the interest, interest deduction rule and the EBITDA rule, um, those the, for the application of that rule, uh, in principle, you should, you should use the tax uh, EBITDA, the, the fiscal EBITDA. Uh, but for the application of the mandatory disclosure directive, you should have a look at the commercial EBIT figures of the transfer. Um, it should be applied for book years, so you should uh, you should have a look at the projected result for the next book years, not calendar years. And what is also important, especially in, 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 uh, uh, for, for Dutch taxpayers, is that it, it is applied at entity level. So you have to look at the EBIT of the transferer on a standalone basis. If the transfer is part of a, a fiscal unity for corporate income tax purposes, you do not have a look at the EBIT of the fiscal unity, which obviously would not change as a result of uh, uh, the transfer, but you have to have a look at the EBIT of the entity on, uh, uh, on a standalone basis. Um, so those are, uh, in a nutshell, the TP-specific hallmarks. Um, uh, but that does not uh, mean that as transfer pricing specialists, we um, uh, uh, do not have to have a look at any of the other hallmarks. Uh, because as I explained in the beginning of this presentation, is that uh, in some for some of the uh, some of the other hallmarks also concern intercompany payments, and that means that you can of course come across uh, 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 some of these other hallmarks, and those should of course be tested as well. Um, uh, uh, so let's have a look at some of the the other hallmarks. Uh, um, one of them is the acquisition of a loss making company uh, after which it continues, it discontinues its, uh, its main activity and uh, uh, the losses of that company are, are used to uh, reduce uh, its tax liability in the future. Um, uh, another example is uh, Hallmark B3 uh, that concerns uh, circular transactions 
resulting in a round tripping of funds. Um, and for uh, those of you who are familiar with Dutch taxation, um, uh, this concerns, for example, cases in which Article 10A of the Corporate Income Tax uh, uh, Act applies. Um, uh, uh, and that, that means the anti-base erosion rules. Um, uh, a brief example could be that you have a parent company uh, uh, abroad um, with a Dutch subsidiary and that parent company first makes a capital contribution into its Dutch subsidiary and that Dutch subsidiary immediately um, lends those funds back to the to the parent company um, against um, an interest uh, and, and the parent company starts making an interest payment to its subsidiary um, and if you uh, uh, if the parent then deducts the interest payment and the interest payment the, the, the interest received is offset in the Netherlands against uh, uh, tax losses uh, that would be a reportable uh, uh, transaction because you are circulating the money around. So you, first you make a capital uh, uh, distribution, entity A makes a capital contribution in, in entity B, and immediately the money goes back from entity B to entity A, but in a different form, and uh, uh, a tax deduction is created in one uh, at one level, whereas there is no effective pickup of the interest income at the level of uh, uh, entity B. Um, a very important category are uh, the hallmarks uh, mentioned under C1. Um, those include uh, arrangements that uh, concern uh, deductible cross-border uh, uh, payments. So particularly, uh, again, uh, interest payments can be concerned and um, uh, then you should think of interest payments that are made to companies that are tax residents in non-cooperative jurisdictions. Uh, uh, okay. There are several nice and sunny islands included on uh, the EU list of non-cooperative jurisdictions. Um, the same is true for um, uh, payments made to uh, recipients that are resident in the jurisdiction that uh, imposes a corporate income tax at uh, 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 a rate of zero or almost zero, uh, but then you should meet a main benefit test. And almost zero is defined as one percent. Um, and uh, or payments that are uh, uh, tax exempt in the other jurisdiction, or uh, uh, payments that benefit from a preferential regime in the other uh, uh, in the other jurisdiction. Um, and an example would be uh, uh, if um, a foreign parent grants. Uh, a loan, uh, an interest-free loan to uh, uh, to a Dutch subsidiary, uh, whereas the uh, so there is effectively no interest payment made by uh, the Dutch subsidiary to its parent company, um, and if the Dutch company uh, uh, applies an interest imputation at an at arm's length rate, tries to deduct, uh, wants to deduct that for Dutch tax purposes. But there is no corresponding pickup uh, at the level of the, the foreign parent because that jurisdiction does not apply uh, interest imputation rules for the corresponding income. Then you should report that. Um, uh, some practical aspects that are uh, 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 important to take account in dealing with mandatory disclosure. Uh, first of all, it is uh, relevant that you consider the implementation of a policy within the group. So how are you going to identify any potentially reportable trans transactions within your group? 
uh, who is going to ga gather uh, uh, the relevant data and when? Uh, who is going to make sure the, the report? Uh, how do you define uh, a transaction as potentially reportable? Because you want to be on the safe side. Uh, you can make a, a, a selection later on whether you're going to report or not, but it is better to, to be on the safe side at least to make sure that as a tax, direct, tax director that you, you are aware of any transaction that may that might be uh, reportable. Um, uh, of course, you have to identify uh, uh, arrangements from the last two years onwards that are potentially reportable. Uh, you have to uh, identify where you should report and who you should report. And of course, also very important, when you have to report in the various jurisdictions. Uh, some jurisdictions already uh, enacted legislation and you already have the reporting obligation there. And the most difficult part is how are you going to collect the uh, data on potentially reportable arrangements? And you may want to consider uh, to implement a tool to facilitate the data gathering within uh, the group. And it will not surprise you that uh, we would be more than willing to to help you with that in case you need any assistance. Um, and finally, you will have to uh, to file the reports and monitor the reporting process. So make sure that you uh, 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 make the um, uh, make the reports in time and uh, uh, also that you get the registration number in case an, uh, any other intermediary uh, makes the, uh, the report. I should also note that if, the, uh, if an arrangement falls within the scope of more than one hallmark, you should re make a report under both hallmarks. So they both should be mentioned. Um, the Dutch tax administration um, uh, also has uh, a knowledge base on its uh, website and what is also uh, uh, very convenient is that they have the possibility to to ask questions um, uh, and uh, uh, this is something you can you can use to to uh, to get some uh, some input in advance and some uh, uh, on whether to you should report it or not and what well, obviously we would be more than willing to assist you as well um, so then uh, some the, the key takeaways are that um, there is a significant increase of compliance burden of companies certainly in respect of transactions that take place for perfectly valid business reasons, so without any aim to uh, to reduce uh, uh, taxes or to get a nice uh, 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 tax benefit. Um, um, you, uh, the, the member states, the the the, the, the hallmarks as uh, included in the uh, in, in the directive. Uh, are a minimum requirement by the EU, so member states have the possibility to uh, uh, to broaden that scope. So always make sure that you check in the uh, in the various jurisdictions uh, whether the interpretation of a, a hallmark and the implementation uh, uh, is the same, um, and. Uh, also, uh, uh, be aware that deadlines are quite tight. So for now, it's uh, it's fine that you uh, uh, that we all have uh, two years time, or that we had two years time to to collect information, which we then are going to report in January of next year. But after the first of January, you will have to to act within 30 days after the um, 
uh, after the first step of implementation has been uh, set. Uh, penalties can potentially be high. So in the Netherlands, uh, uh, they can be as high as 830,000 euros. Um, and although the uh, uh, penalties, well, it, 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 it will probably not be uh, that, that bad uh, if you uh, unintentionally uh, uh, make a mistake in the, fir the first times, but um, you, you definitely want to avoid those, those, those penalties. Um, well, we, uh, we ran out of time, so we, we were not able to, uh, to, to answer all the questions, but we will have a look at those later on and uh, uh, try to come back to you uh, individually um uh, 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 with that um we would uh, uh, we hope you enjoyed this uh, this webinar uh, uh, and uh, gained some additional insight on the mandatory disclosure directive um, and we kindly invite you to join any of our upcoming webinars the next webinar will be on the 8th of October and will be on financial transactions. So in case you would be interested, you um, we invite you to 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 invite uh, to send us a short email uh, and to register for that webinar. Thank you all for joining us today. I think um, along the way we have managed to answer at least uh, a small number of questions. Um, uh, as noted by, by Stefan, uh, there's a few uh, open still and most likely yeah, the more critical ones. So we'll be back with you shortly on those individually. Thank you so much for uh, joining us and till next time.